morning, everybody. Welcome to day three of the Leadership Conference. So we got one more keynote speaker coming up. Thank you for bearing with us through the uh, little security issues, and we had to push it back a little bit. This talk is going to go now from 0910 to 10. So if you do have a flight you need to catch or anything like that, if you exit those doors and then on the steps downstairs, you'll take the same route that you took to alumni where you stayed your bags. So you can grab your bags, and then there will be buses and vans staged to take you where you need to go. Our amazing transportation team has, uh, should have all your flights covered, so don't fret too much about missing any flights. But up now to introduce our final speaker is our IA officer, Carol, Carol Schreier. Good morning. Our final keynote speaker is a veteran of the U.S. Navy Reserve and a man with personal experience in leading through adversity at multiple times in his life. John Crowley is currently the executive chairman of Amicus Therapeutics, a global biotechnology company which he founded in 2005, focused on discovering and developing treatments for rare and devastating genetic diseases. Mr. Crowley's involvement with biotechnology stems from the 1998 diagnosis of two of his children with Pompeii disease, a severe and often fatal neuromuscular disorder. His family's journey to save his children and thousands of others worldwide is the sub subject of Jita Anand's Pulitzer Prize winning book, The Cure, and the major motion picture, Extraordinary Measures, starring Harrison Ford, Carrie Russell, and Brendan Fraser. Amicus today has grown under Mr. Crowley's leadership to be one of the world's leading biotechnology companies, employing more than 500 people in more than 24 countries and has a market value of nearly $4 billion. After attending the Naval Academy with the class of 1990, Mr. Crowley graduated from Georgetown University with a Bachelor's of Science in Foreign Service and earned a JD from the University of Notre Dame Law School and an MBA from the Harvard Business School. He served as an intelligence officer in the U.S. Navy Reserve from 2005 to 2016 and completed three tours of active duty, including serving as the Deputy J-2 for an elite special operations task force in Afghanistan in 2011. His assignments included service with the Joint Special Operations Command, the Naval Special Warfare Development Group, and the U.S. Central Intelligence Agency. Mr. Crowley has also served as the national chairman of the Make-A-Wish Foundation of America. He delivered the commencement address to the University of Notre Dame's class of 2020, where he was awarded an honorary doctorate degree. And he serves on the board of directors of the United States Naval Academy Foundation. Before we welcome Mr. Crowley onto the stage to speak, please join me in viewing the trailer to the movie Extraordinary Measures. In both kids, it's the heart that's the real threat to their lives. How much more time do we have? Megan, maybe a year. Patrick, less. I wish that we had a drug to treat Pompeii, but we simply don't. I'm sorry. Dr. Stonehill. Yeah. This is John Crowley. All the researchers out there say that you're a genius on the verge of a scientific breakthrough. I'm not on the verge of anything. How much would it take to prove your theory? The odds against you are crushing. So where does that leave your kids when the dad has no job and no health insurance? You're right. This is crazy. But I can't just sit around and wait for my kids to die. I promised them that we'd raise 500. That's all? 1,000. Is it 500 or 1,000? 500,000. Are you totally insane? Apparently. Was he worth it? A Stonehill guy? He's really eccentric, but his science is way ahead of everybody else's. Do you have a wife? Uh, ex-wives. Two of them. Yeah? How come? Because I'm so easy to get along with. Figure any dude in a business suit can help me raise venture capital and run the company. But who's going to be half as motivated as a dad who's trying to save his own kids? We can do this. We push 
ourselves. We work around the clock. I already work around the clock. Great. Cure diseases in theory, but never help a single human being in reality. I can't cure your kids, you know that, but I think I can save their lives. But what if he succeeds too late? And what? You're in clinical trials by the end of the year, or we pull the plug. Nobody is going to tell me how to run my lab. We're out of time. Are you crazy? You've jeopardized your chances of ever getting your kids treated. Do you remember you told me that I should stop chasing miracles? Well, don't get your hopes up, kid. Say Hail Mary. I will restrain him. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction and the great privilege to be here to speak at the Naval Academy. It is always wonderful to come back to the yard. Um, I can tell you the movie trailer that you just saw captured about five years of our family's lives from about the year 1998 to 2003. And throughout my talk, I'll have a chance to, to weave in various facts, but a lot of learnings uh, for my wife Eileen and I in this journey in life. Um, the movie trailer um, stuck to the facts of our life. It was very important for Harrison Ford as the executive producer of the movie as well as one of the, the stars of the film that he got the family dynamic, that he got the science and the medicine correct. They took some liberties with the business. They composited some characters. They changed some of the cities and locations. Uh, my daughter Megan does like to tell people that the movie does contain one of the great fictions in the history of Hollywood. And that's how they found an actor who's six, six foot five to play me. <laughs> uh, before I begin, I'd like to welcome some very special guests here with me today. My wife, Eileen, is here. Um, my, my, my plea beer roommate and great friend of many years, Travis Kroll, and his wife, Stacy, from Pennsylvania. And another, another great friend, Mike Burns. Mike and I served in the same uh, Navy Reserve Intelligence Unit and deployed to Afghanistan together and spent a lot of time traveling uh, to a lot of places around the world with some of those units that you heard mentioned. Uh, so Mike Burns appear as well. I, uh, if, if you guys have ever seen the movie Spies Like Us with Chevy Chase and Dan Aykroyd, Mike, Mike and I to this day are still pretty sure we were the decoys. We, uh, the, the name of your conference is Returning with Honor, Trials to Triumphs. I've had a chance to reflect a little bit around the nature of leadership through adversity. And as you see here, the, the title of my talk will be Rejoicing in Hope, Patient in Tribulation. So in reflecting about leadership through adversity, in preparing these marks today, I've taken some of the lessons from our family's journeys, some of the challenges, some of the great joys that we've had. You know, a number of weeks ago, I was asked in an interview if I could talk to my 18-year-old self, what's the one thing that I would tell myself many, many years ago? And so it was a different question than I'd gotten before in interviews, and I thought about it. At first, I thought, well, maybe I'll tell myself, buy Apple stock. And then I realized when I was 18 years old, I didn't have the money to buy Apple stock. So I thought a little bit more about it. And, you know, up to that point in life, I had known challenges and adversity. My father was a police officer, and he died in a tragic accident on duty when I was seven years old. We moved into a two-bedroom, one-bath house, my mother, my brother, and I, with my grandma, my grandpa, and my aunt. We struggled, but when I was 18 years old, I got an appointment to the U.S. Naval Academy. I thought I had reached the pinnacle of everything that I had hoped for. I thought at that point, Life would be just fine because I had succeeded. Well, I think what I realized a couple of weeks ago in that interview is that if I had one thing to tell my 18-year-old self, it would be that, you know what, life is going to be continually filled with setbacks, sometimes tragedies, 
and adversity. And our, your, mine, happiness, fulfillment, and success in life is going to be directly proportionate to how we respond to such adversity. You see, as human beings, we are defined at our core by how we respond to hardship. This concept is not new. I'm reminded of the words of John Kennedy in his first inaugural address. President Kennedy ended by talking about the need for endurance. He talked about a call to bear the burden of a long twilight struggle, year in and year out, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation. The message for President Kennedy at that time was to the nation to talk about the long fight, the long journey, the arduous journey in the fight against communism. For each of you, it will be your own personal challenges. Some will be professional, some will be family, some will affect just you, some may affect your children, your community, your nation, or the world. So today what I'd like to do this morning is to share with you what I think are the six most essential traits and tools for your success as junior officers and leaders in our military and as citizens of the United States. These are lessons I've learned from Eileen and I's journey in life, my journey through the world of medicine and biotechnology, in business and in the military. And then I'll provide you with some thoughts on how and where you can apply them in your careers ahead and the foundation that you will leave for future generations. And I'll conclude with an overarching theme and share my view of why ultimately leading through adversity must be grounded in faith and in love. So, six things to remember. I, you know, leadership really is about how do you handle, how do you manage, how do you inspire others in times of adversity. It's really easy to lead when everything is going well. And I like to tell people, you know, if you think your jobs someday are to sit in a big office and have people bring your reports and share good news all day, good luck. No, your job and the reason you've come to the Naval Academy and all the great institutions represented here today, you've come so that you can be leaders to solve problems. Some of these tools and traits, I believe, will aid you in those moments throughout your careers and your life. The first is a sense of humor and humility. You've got to be able to laugh. There were some really hard times with our children. You know, we, we got the diagnosis of this disease that we had never heard of. It was a Friday the 13th, uh, coming up on 25 years this March, where we were told that our young daughter, Megan, had this form of muscular dystrophy. And our greatest fear at that point, and Megan up to about a year of age, was seemingly very healthy the perfect child. And then we realized physically she wasn't doing the things that a child may do. She wasn't pulling up in the crib or taking those first steps. And so we went from pediatrician to neurologist, from blood test to muscle biopsy. And then we got that devastating news that she had this disease again that we'd never heard of. There's no history in our family. Eileen and I are recessive carriers, just like any one of us are recessive carriers for on average about a dozen rare genetic diseases. We asked the doctor, is it serious? And he said yes, and he told us she wouldn't live to be but a couple of years of age. That was a really tough time. And then he looked down at our son, Patrick, who was seven days old in his car carrier, and he said he needs to be tested because there's a 25% chance he may have the disease as well. And Patrick was tested a few months later and tested positive as well for Pompe disease. So, the good news is, through all of that, through the challenges of many years, and I'll touch on just a few of those as well, and, and the movie captures, again, many of the challenges of making a medicine and getting our kids treated, along with many, many others. Um, but the good news, I'll jump forward a quarter of a century. The good news now is that Megan is 26, Patrick will soon be 25 years old. On January 9th, 2003, they were able to receive the first of what would be a lifelong series of every other week enzyme replacement infusions to replace the missing enzyme in their body. And so for Megan and Patrick and our family, our older son, John, who was married just over a year ago, and now our seven-month-old granddaughter, Stella. You can see the Crowley family today. This is just a couple of months ago. 
Megan and Patrick are still in wheelchairs and still require ventilators to breathe, but the medicine fixed the dangerous enlargement of their hearts, which would have been the fatal cause of, of their disease. Their hearts today are perfectly healthy and normal. They're much stronger than they otherwise could have been and would have been, and they're alive and happy and healthy. Thankfully, the, the, the disease never affects the mind, and they're incredibly bright. Megan went on to graduate from the University of Notre Dame in 2019, and then she went on to earn a master's in social work from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and Megan now works for the Make-A-Wish Foundation. So this was the uh, 40th anniversary gala for Make-A-Wish held in Disney World a little while ago. If you look really carefully, you can see Stella there. She, we had the pink headphones on. It was a ballroom of about 1,500 people, and Patrick and Megan holding Stella in her first couple of months of life. So that's the Crowley family today. And a lot of what's gotten us through a lot of the hard times in life has been the appreciation of the joy in those moments of living and also a sense of humor and humility. Make-A-Wish has been an incredibly important part of our family's life long after the kids got their wishes to go to Disney World. Again, almost half of all wish kids today wishes are to go to Disney World um, or some, something Disney related. For uh, Megan, it was 2001, Patrick, 2004. We've been involved as a family with Make-A-Wish. And one of the secrets of Make-A-Wish is that it makes our lives better. It gives back to each of us. A number of years ago, when I was the national chairman of the Make-A-Wish Foundation, um, you know, we experience emotional events at Make-A-Wish, but they're always filled with hope, strength, and joy. And at one of those events, we had a chance to thank one of the great wish granters of all time, in fact, the greatest wish granter in the history of Make-A-Wish, from WWE, John Cena. I think at last count, John has granted over 600 wishes, and I've seen him with these kids, and the time that he spends, the emotion he puts into it. So we honor John as our humanitarian of the year. And John, I will tell you, at a cocktail party, I went up to him, I had not met him, talked to him, a wonderful fella. And uh, I said, hey, John, I said, you know, I, can I get a picture with you? The kids would really like to see this. He said, yeah, yeah, for sure. So we're standing at this cocktail reception at a high cocktail table. And he said, um, he said hey, do you want to arm wrestle for the picture? And John Cena. And so I looked at him and I said, well, not really. And he said, no, come on, it'll be fun. And I said, yeah, for you. <laughs> so then we, sent, we took this picture. So I was pretty proud of that moment, so I sent it back, a text message on the group family thread. My son John, who thinks, you know, he's the oldest and he's the boy, and uh, John lives uh, with Asperger's and, and has overcome his adversity in life as well in so many ways. But to John, the world is black and white, so John texts back, wow, Dad, you're really strong. My daughter Megan, who's always been the great cynic, Megan texts back, this picture is such BS I cannot even tell you. So having that sense of humor, but let me tell you also about humility. That night when John Cena got up to the podium, he talked about, he said when Vince McMahon, the, the CEO of WWE, called him, he said, look, the Make-A-Wish people want you to grant a wish. And he said, what? He said, yeah, there's a young boy, he's living with cystic fibrosis, genetic lung disease, and there were no treatments for it at the time. He said his only wish in life is to spend some time with you. And he got very emotional in front of about a thousand people in the audience. And he said, he said, this young man could have gone anywhere, had anything, met anyone, and the only thing he wanted in life was to spend time with me. He said, do you know how humbling that is? And this giant of a fella had tears pouring down his face. And the mother of the young boy who had died several years after that was in the audience as well. And what a great lesson you know, this unbelievably wealthy, famous, you know, fella here who didn't need to do this. He did it because it was not only right to be there that evening, he's done it over 600 times. So we've laughed together, and I think just one example of the importance of humility. It's also important, I think, the second trait to have to lead through adversity is to always have hope. Hope in the most difficult of circumstances. A lot of times as a leader, people are going to look at you and not know what to do. 
And sometimes you're not going to know what to do either. But to exude a level of confidence and calm, and to just be able to tell people, look, this is really tough. Acknowledge that. Don't sugarcoat it. But provide some measure of hope, hope often tempered with reality. And it's important to realize that hope is going to be for people in that moment, for people who need that hope on that day. My first day in biotechnology, I didn't go to our research labs. Um, we were only a handful of people in our first company. We, uh, I went up to, the, to Boston, to the Biotechnology Industry Organization Convention. And it was um, spring of uh, 2000. A couple of years after our kid's diagnosis, and it was really exciting. We had just decoded the human genome. It was the beginning of the genomics revolution. And I went to the keynote address that night. The keynote address was given by this man. Christopher Reeve. Christopher Reeve was an actor, big, strong fella. So big and so strong that he played Superman himself in the movies in the 70s and 80s. Well, Chris was involved in a horse, uh, horse accident, flipped from a horse, and broke his neck at, at C3, rendered a quadriplegic in a wheelchair on a ventilator. And he gave the keynote address at that biotech convention. And he rolled out on the stage about 5,000 people in the audience. And I'll never forget his words. He said, biotechnology, that's a great big word that for people like me just means hope. He said, it's the hope that someday I can throw a ball to my kids again or hold my wife's hand and walk on a beach. It's the hope that you'll come up with a treatment or a cure for paralysis. And it was very moving. And you know, where we were in our journey with our kids, I can very much empathize and relate to his words. But then he said something I'll never forget. He said, it's not just hope, though, for me and for people like me today who know that they need hope. It's hope for many, many more people to come who today don't know that they're going to need that hope. He said it's the young man who's going to break his neck on a football field or the young lady in a diving accident. He said they're going to go years from now online and they're going to Google and search. They're going to come up with your names. They're going to look at ideas that you've not yet even had. They're going to read about as many of your failures as they will your success. He said. So hope is really important. And I've tried to take that forward in our life as I think about how hard it's been in building a biotechnology company, all the setbacks and challenges that our family has had, that our kids have had to endure, and so many other families. In the world of rare genetic diseases, there are more than 8,000 known rare genetic diseases today that collectively in the world affect about a half a billion people more than 30 million just here in the United States. Many people, though, live with these diseases and don't even know it. Many will have children. And they're going to go and they're going to look at organizations like ours and many others. And they're going to look at academic research. They may look to some of the work that some of you may do in providing hope. So that notion of hope is just so essential. So together with a sense of humor and humility, you've got to have and you've got to provide hope. You've also got to be persistent, and you've got to persevere. It's another essential trait of leading through adversity. When I started in that first biotechnology company, I didn't know what I was doing. I was young. We were just, I had just come out of business school. I had over $100,000 in student loans, but I had a great education. I had a great job, and then all of a sudden, life was turned upside down, and we were determined to do everything we could to learn about this disease that we'd never heard of and then determined to do everything we could to try to change the course of that prognosis for our family and for others. Um, and it's tough. Look, science is tough. We can, in biotechnology, we can hire the most brilliant researchers, build the most incredible research facilities, raise hundreds of millions, sometimes billions of dollars. And still, almost every scientific idea we put into Animal studies or human clinical studies, it doesn't work. And even when it does, it almost always takes longer and costs a lot more money. But we've got to persevere. In my first week 
on that job and that first, starting that first biotech company. My mom had sent me a, a note of encouragement and in that note she put a small little brass plaque. And it was a quote from Winston Churchill and it said simply, never, never, never quit. And there were a lot of times in that journey, a lot of the, what's captured in the film where I wanted to quit, where I knew I wasn't the smartest person in the room to solve this problem, where we didn't have enough money, we didn't have enough time. But sometimes I'd look at that plaque that I put, and I still have on my desk today, in our family picture, and I would realize that, you know, I've got to go back and do everything we can to solve this problem. One of the other things I have in my office is a picture of, of this man. It's Dr. Jonas Salk. It's a picture of Dr. Salk in the 1950s. And in the 1940s, 1950s, one of the health plagues was polio. Devastating disease, disease that FDR and many, many millions of people struggled and suffered with. And if you had polio at the time as a child, you might have to walk in braces and with crutches if it was severe enough, they didn't have ventilators like our children have today, you'd have to live in an iron lung that would breathe for you. And that's an iron lung unit in the 1940s. That was your life, not a lot of hope. And so Dr. Salk was involved at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Research Center in the development of a vaccine. And after a number of years of work, Dr. Salk had done a test, a clinical trial of his vaccine, and it was a failure. So years of work, millions of dollars that he had raised from various organizations to develop that vaccine for polio didn't work. And there was a great article I read years later, an interview with Dr. Salk, where he talked about he thought he was going to quit. He had tried hard and had to move on with something else. Someone else would pick up polio vaccine research. And he talked about, you know, gee, how is he going to just tell this to his teammates, to his family, to the people who had funded him? And he said he went to a park and went for a long walk and he sat on a park bench. And he said when he sat on that park bench, he saw children playing in the park. And he said it hit him in that moment that some of those children may one day contract polio. They could suffer, maybe even die from polio. And he said he realized the enormity and the importance of the task in front of him. And so he said he went back to it with a renewed vigor. And thankfully he did, and the next time he tried, Dr. Salk was successful, and that polio vaccine changed the course of public health and human health, and in some ways changed the course of history. So you've got to persevere. You've got to push forward, even when you want to quit, even when people are telling you it's time to quit. Biotech, again, is a really hard job, but when we do succeed, when we do develop those medicines, I still think it's one of the best jobs you can have. To lead through adversity, you also need to be an optimist. So you've got to have that perspective that, you know, we can do this. We can solve these problems. Anybody know who this is? Ernest Shackleton. So we've all heard of Shackleton's journey a little over 100 years ago to the South Pole, and when they got stuck for a very, very long period of time in the ice on his ship Endurance. We all know that story, but one of the things I found fascinating in reading about Shackleton was one of the ways that they survived and they endured that terrible time stuck in that ice and the journey across hundreds of miles to safety and to be rescued was because of the team that he selected. So let me read you an advertisement. Before that journey, newspaper advertisement said, men wanted for hazardous journey, small wages, bitter cold, long months of complete darkness, constant danger, safe return, doubtful, honor and recognition in case of success. This is not an advertisement from the Naval Academy uh, admissions brochure. This is what Shackleton put out. And one of the most amazing things is when people applied, he said he put them into three different buckets, mad, hopeless, and possible. He only interviewed people in the possible category. And what he interviewed for was attitude. He said, 
He looked for people whose teeth were good, whether they suffered from varicose veins, but most importantly, did they have a good temper? Could they sing? Could they entertain each other? And the lesson here, hire for attitude, train for skill. Shackleton understood that the more volatile and uncertain the environment, the more important it is to have individuals who can and want to embrace the disruption, who understand how to thrive in ambiguity and respond quickly to unforeseen challenges. Think about that of yourself, but think about that as you build teams, as you choose teammates. Another great optimist is our daughter, Megan. So the medicine that we discovered and were able to get to Patrick and Megan and others again fix the dangerous enlargement of their heart. For a time, it made Megan much stronger. Gave us time to go back to the drawing board and to come up with the next generation medicine. In those intervening years, Megan went through school, worked hard, played hard, has had a wonderful life. But one of the challenges is that the medicine couldn't keep up with her upper body, the upper body strength. So Megan started to develop a severe scoliosis. We, uh, one of the times Eileen and I were a hero to Megan was in 2010, we, we were able to have her meet the Jonas Brothers. So you can see up in this picture, Megan, her the cousin Bridget meeting the Jonas Brothers. But you can see Megan's head is tilted to the side. And if you could see on x-ray at this time, Megan's cur spine was curved more than 100 degrees. It was becoming painful and it was becoming life-threatening. And there was no medicine in the world that we can think of coming up with that could change that. And so we went, we talked to doctors, most of whom said there's nothing we could do. And after all the years of developing the medicine, to see Megan suffer like this. And so we went to see a doctor, a Dr. David Roy, at Columbia in New York, chief of pediatric orthopedic surgery. And his specialty was neuromuscular disease in children. And he looked at Megan and he said, I think I can fix the dangerous curvature of your spine, I can help you. And he looked at her and he said, um, but you need to know some of the risks. He said, you know, among the risks, he said, is that um, there's a 10 to 15% chance you won't survive the operation. And so Eileen and I thought, and we're like, my God, we can't let Megan go through this. And she's just looked very calmly and said, I understand. We said, Eileen, or Eileen and I said, you know, Megan, you're getting older. You have to make this decision for yourself. She came back a week later and she said, I've made my decision. I don't like the way I look and I don't like the way I feel. I'd like to have the surgery, but I'd like to wait to the end of my sophomore year of high school so I can get through my final exams. And so we did that and several months later, Megan ended up having to endure three 10 to 12 hour surgeries. The second surgery, her heart stopped and they almost, we almost lost her. At the end of that third surgery, thankfully it was successful, but it had been a long seven weeks in the intensive care unit. And we came in, we were all tired and frustrated, and we realized that the young resident on duty that Friday night in New York had forgot to order the pain medicine, and the anesthesia was wearing off, and Megan was just suffering. And I tried to stay calm, but I had lost it and got really upset. And then I felt this little hand reach over, and it was Megan laying there. And again, just having just come out of surgery, and she just kind of mouthed, she said, it's okay, Daddy. She said, I just don't want you to be upset. And there were about 10 people in that hospital room who just stopped. And in that one quiet moment, to think about that measure of optimism and that strength that Megan was able to convey, not just for her, but for me, for Eileen, for everybody in that room. So another lesson in life for us, and then you've got to be that optimist. You've got to be that eternal optimist. You've also got to realize the nature of sacrifice. You all sacrifice. Hard work is the price of success. But it's going to be important to recognize the sacrifice of others in what you do. In the work that, that Mike and I did, um, we deployed with a, a team to uh, Afghanistan Task Force East in 2011. And uh, by the nature of our reserve orders, Mike and I and a few others came back before some of the other team members there. Um, on our way out, we were waiting. We were at Bagram Airfield, and you, know, you just want to get home. 
and you're sitting there, we're there about six, seven hours, and you know, they had some bottles of water, and that was about it, and we're kind of tired, a little cranky, and we looked up at this faded poster of American troops, and it really struck me in the moment. This is the actual picture I took with my iPhone, sitting there at Bagram, and it would, had been there for a number of years. And it just said, as you could read, this is a tribute to all who have fallen during Operation Enduring Freedom. Live a life worthy of their sacrifice. So that struck us in the moment. It certainly put in perspective. It was a very, very, very small sacrifice we had made in serving. Six days later, we got a call in the morning, and it was from a senior enlisted at the command, and said, sir, I want to let you know you're going to see something on the news um, it's really painful. He said, they're gone. I said, uh, you know, Master Chief, who's gone? He said, the team, they're all gone. And so it was that with Extortion 17 and the team that we had served with, these 30 faces of Americans in a helicopter that was downed in Afghanistan, the entire team was lost. And again, in that moment, you think, you know, how can that be? We were just with them. And two days later, Mike and I joined a couple of other uh, 100 members of the command at uh, Dover Air Force Base to receive their remains. You know, again, one, one of the most solemn and dignified moments that you can go through is, as a citizen, but certainly as a member of the military. And one of the things we'll never forget is the look on the family's faces and that the, the, the shock, the grief, the denial, all the emotions, but a certain calmness that pervaded because they were there together and they were being supported by a remarkable community. And as painful as that was, you know, for us, you talk about sacrifice, we all have seen and heard and read about sacrifice, to see it in that moment, to see it in the faces of those spouses, those children, those moms and dads, that's the real face of sacrifice. So one thing you'll have to do as a leader is to be the calm and competent one in those moments of crisis in those moments of the tragedy of others. That takes courage in its own right. It takes always remembering, and something I'll always remember for my life, to live a life worthy of their sacrifice. The final trait is going to be courage. You've got to be brave. We think, we read about in all of our studies, some of the great heroes. Heroes of our military, heroes in every aspect of life, men who walked on the moon, and thankfully, a man, a woman, and a person of color going back to the moon in the next two years. There are a lot of heroes, a lot of people of great courage. One that I'd point you to is Mother Teresa of Calcutta. And you can say, okay, all right, Mother Teresa, fine. We're never going to compare it to that. And you're probably right. But when you think about what the Sisters of Charity have done in building hundreds of orphanages and soup kitchens around the world well outside of where they were begun, in the slums of Calcutta. One story you may not know is that in the waning days of the war in Afghanistan, there were five sisters of charity who had never met or known Mother Teresa, and they were in Kabul, and they were taking care of 14 disabled children. They were offered many, many times for the five sisters to leave, and they refused. They refused to leave those 11 young women and three boys who were severely disabled Finally, the United States and Italy was able to get them on the next to last flight out of Kabul. The courage that they had to have to be there in that place at that time, the courage for others, is to me just a remarkable example of courage and faith and determination. So you will be leaders in the most powerful, the greatest, and the most moral military the world has ever known. You will know challenges ahead for your families, yourself, your nation, and the world. You'll lead with character and moral courage. You will work and fight to keep America's role as the world's most indispensable nation. And in the words of Ronald Reagan, always remember that no weapon in the arsenals of the world is as formidable as the will and moral courage of free man and woman. But know that real strength and power in the defense of our nation and the ideals that we live lie not in the exercise of force, 
but in the projection of character and of values. And know that our character and values are driven always by knowing that you serve a higher purpose in this world, that it is bigger than you, and that it is strongest when grounded in faith. Faith is defined by theologians as an assurance of the things hoped for and a conviction of things unseen. You can use all the traits and tools that I just described earlier and many more, but if you lack faith, it'll be difficult for you to truly succeed. It'll be difficult to rise to the greatest of challenges and to endure the greatest of tragedies and suffering. Without faith, it'll be impossible to believe in your heart and soul that there really truly is something bigger than you. You can decide whether the emptiness that you feel at times will be filled with a lifetime of fear and anxieties or with the presence of God. Christian, Jew, Muslim, whatever your faith, we are all children of Abraham. We all have a soul. And as Faulkner once wrote, man will endure because he has a soul, a spirit, to lead through adversity, for each of you to return here one day to overcome your own trials and to triumph ahead, you must have faith. And don't just listen to or believe me, look to some of the greatest leaders this country has ever known. Look to people like FDR who on December 8, 1941, told Americans that we are inspired by a faith that goes back through all the years to the first chapter of Genesis, to when God created man in his own image. Look to somebody as great as Abraham Lincoln, and there's a wonderful article I cut out a couple of years ago written by a rabbi, and the title of it is What the Bible Taught Lincoln About America. And it said, in wartime, a president who once seemed indifferent to religion evolved into a theologian of liberty and quoted Lincoln that without the assistance of the divine being, I cannot succeed. Without that assistance, I cannot fail. Look to the words of the great Dr. Martin Luther King, who said, in this world, there is a God whose matchless strength is a fit contrast to the weakness of man. Look to somebody as great as Senator John McCain, one of the great heroes of America and of this institution. His religious awakening and his deep faith began in a prison in Vietnam, and he carried it with him throughout his life. When he accepted his party's nomination for president of the United States, he described some of the difficult times in that prison. And he said that relying on faith led him to a greater love of life and a greater love of his country. And he realized in that prison, he was not his own man anymore. He was his country's. And so the lesson, the final lesson here is leadership is about love. Love of family, of friends, of community, of classmates, of teammates, of God, of country, of something bigger than yourself. John McCain is buried just a couple of hundred yards from here. On his headstone, proudly, are naval aviator wings, something that represented so much to Senator McCain. You'll have to think about, someday, a long, long time from now, what will be on your headstone. Maybe something like this quote from the Bible, from 2 Timothy, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. You will face a lifetime of challenges ahead. Be patient in your tribulation, but rejoice in hope. Enjoy all those times with your family, your friends. Live in it, laugh in it, cherish it, and always hope for another. Lead with humor and humility, hope, perseverance, optimism. Recognize the sacrifice of others. Be courageous and always keep the faith. I pray for our armed forces everywhere, and for your families, you, each of you, are the greatest hope in the years ahead. You are our most powerful weapon, and God speed, God speed, and God bless all of you. And as always, go Navy. Lead Army.
We now have some time to take questions for Mr. Crowley. So if you have questions, please come to one of the two microphones in the front. And if you're up top, just shout them loud. Hello, Mr. Crowley. I'm Mitch and Cassano Boris, uh, Princeton University. Uh, when I was about Princeton. Princeton. Oh, that's great. Our kids went to Princeton Grammar School, Middle School, and High School. That's awesome. When I was uh, seven but, years, but not university. No. <laughs> when I was uh, like seven years old, um, I was really interested in science. And one of the first books I read with my dad, he was a pharmacist. We'd read a little bit every night. Was the Cure. So it's really amazing uh, that I got to hear you speak today. I'm actually a molecular bio major at Princeton, um, and I owe it a lot to, to somebody else that way book. smarter than me. So please. <laughs> Um, my question for you, uh, and uh, I guess a lot of the leaders in this room who will one day have to deliver bad news, uh, you know, to their team or whoever they're leading, um, obviously you are tackling a problem of such enormity, um, you know, with your children. So when you encountered setbacks, how did you as a leader deliver those words to continue to motivate your team uh, to continue to persevere? Yeah, I think whenever you're talking about setbacks. So for us in our business, whether it was a clinical trial failure or some, some other aspect, you know, we had to manage through the financial crisis or really tough times in business. But also, you know, ours is a very personal business too. So when a clinical trial fails, it's not just a setback in business. You know, we know these families, we know many of the children, adults living with these diseases. So it hits particularly hard. And what I've learned over the years is you, you want to deliver it quickly, the bad news. You want to be transparent. Tell people everything you know. You've got to be calm. You've got to be competent that whatever the setback is, we'll get through it. You can't sugarcoat it. Um, and in the moments and time and hours and days after, you've got to be visible and present. You've got to you know, show that leadership and show that empathy and listen. So if you could do all that, I think you know, you'll, you'll provide some measure of relief to folks. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Good morning, sir. Good My morning. name is Mitch Hitman, fourth class, Kajal Dome Gray. I'm from Princeton, New Jersey, but I attend the Naval Academy. Um, I was curious about what aspects of your time in the military or your military training during your time at the Academy contributed the most to the way that you approached obstacles and adversity in your professional and personal life? Yeah, look, I, I, I would go back to the, there's some very fundamental disciplines that you will develop, right? Time management, incredibly important. I could be in a business meeting today, and Mike, I know the same way, and Travis as well. Um, and we can point out somebody who has had military experience. Um, wherever, wherever they served, however they enlisted, officer, whatever it may be, there's just something a little bit you know, you, different, unique, about not, not just how they carry themselves, but how they think, how they listen, how they participate. So some of those disciplines that may seem um, to make no sense today, they really do serve a purpose. And then there's obviously some of the things that, that I talked about, you know, realizing in team building, selecting those teammates, you know, the whole notion again of you know, selecting people for attitude, training for skill. It's a good part of why you're all at the Naval Academy and, and other great institutions as well. So th there's so much about what you'll learn and be a part of in the military. Um, and the last part is the, uh, the leaders, the role models that you will have, and people very young in their careers themselves that you will have as role models, you won't get that anywhere else outside of the military. Thank you, sir. So. Great, well thank you again. On behalf of the United States Naval Academy, we would like to present Mr. Crowley with a gift of thank you. When I was a midshipman, they never gave me many gifts, so that's <laughs> great. This is great. Thank you so much. God bless. And that is it. So. If you do have a flight, feel free to dip out, but we're going to say a few closing remarks. Figure out how to work this thing. Yep.
All right, so this is our departure information. Carol and Matt, are you in here? Do you know how to explain this, or is this a Matt thing? <laughs> All right, so we have vans and buses waiting in front of alumni for transportation to the airports. I sent an email with this transportation information.